democratization exercise once we're in a position to finance. Um, the World Bank currently has a strategy called Maximizing Finance for Development, which in the future will also uh, look to finding ways to leverage private sector financing. So the idea is that we would come in with uh, some supporting financing or guarantees in the case of the energy sector that would leverage uh, funding from the private sector. Uh, in the particular case of um, energy, we are currently involved in the Matoka uh, design stage work, feasibility studies and um, environmental studies. Uh, also the Kariba Dam repairs. And uh, we're also helping to um, support the Southern Africa Power Pool, which would then obviously provide opportunities for Zimbabwe to benefit from energy from uh, neighboring countries as well. And I think uh, one of the things that has been discussed, at least at the latest in Daba in Cape Town, was power mining integration types of uh, projects. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to innovate around what to do in the new um, dispensation to try to take advantage of new uh, models that are being developed uh, elsewhere in the world uh, to, uh, to assist with the access to infrastructure and services. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, I, I was listening to the presentations uh, from the representatives of two commercial banks, and I think what came out largely from what I heard are, are the constraints and uh, the, the issues that we are faced with. But uh, I would have been keen to hear more about what can we do. Uh, thank you for uh, the uh, indications of the World Bank. And I think they do have experience over the global picture of lending. Uh, but most of the assistance that uh, is coming out of the World Bank presentation is from the partners around the structure of the World Bank. But I'm looking at private uh, 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 capital being attracted into Zimbabwe, what can be done to bring that private capital, which is uh, very little to do with the wealth? Um, so I think uh, part of what uh, can be done is to develop the policy framework, I think it was uh, mentioned in the previous panel, to subscribe, uh, to, you know, to raise, for example, your, the ranking of Zimbabwe on the Fraser uh, Institute's policy perception index which uh, I think in 2017 was third from the bottom. So trying to get that improved would be significant uh, in terms of attracting capital from for, for commercial entities uh, outside the, the country. I think also the EITI, and uh, that's something that we're now currently in discussion, uh, in discussion with government, the Extractive Industries um, uh, Index would also help to uh, reassure investors from abroad that Zimbabwe has uh, you know, put in place the necessary measures to improve transparency and governance of the sector. And uh, the facilities that I mentioned in terms of the guarantees would also help to bring the, the private, uh, allow private banks within Zimbabwe to extend the maturity of loans, for example, or to offer, offer facilities um, that would allow trade facilitation, uh, if that's a priority. Um, we are also in a position to do projects which uh, attract private sector investment uh, into the mining sector. Uh, we are doing, for example, in Tanzania, for, for the small-scale um, entrepreneurs, in Tanzania we have a multi-stakeholder partnership with the large-scale mining companies, Ashanti Gold and others, uh, the government and um, uh, small-scale miners to try to improve access to finance, pro provide them with data, data that's required and also to provide them with uh, skills and uh, uh, training. So at all levels, uh, into, uh, government to, bank to government, uh, bank to the private sector, financial sector, as well as directly to um, the small scale um, uh, entities. Those things are possible. But what we look to the Chamber of, Congress, uh, Ch Chamber of Minds to do is to help us to identify priorities for um, support in the next uh, generation so that we can uh, tailor the support to meet the needs that are uh, emerging. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think I have to took that in my presentation. Or well, maybe I could just highlight briefly what we've done as Standard Bank. We have funded up to 70% of the capital requirements of the industries of last year. 
Uh, but we take cognizance of the fact that it's not just bank funding that's going to be appropriate for mining projects. This is why I mentioned that there's the need to leash the right kind of capital to the level of the development of the mineral project. Uh, and in particular, there's the need to, ha to, to harness or for a collaborative partnership between government, and the, the mining sector, and the investing community. The mining sector has to recognize the fact that there's a lot of good work that it is doing, but it's not clearly understood. So it's to champion your cause. That's your role. The government has to understand that over and above the commodity risk, the counterpart risk, there's a regulator risk, which is quite huge and significant for them, and that is going to be addressed. The investing community has got to, uh, to revisit the way it looks at our opportunities in the mining, particularly the domestic economy. We can't expect all the capital that goes into the mining sector to come from overseas. It's a good risk signal if um, uh, lightly regulated capital from pension funds or other insurance uh, companies is allowed to flow into the mining sector. This will create a healthy vibrant of capital based in country which allow for a meaningful participation in investment projects with foreign investors. So you don't have issues of free carry or people asking to be given shares for free because you have developed um, a healthy base yourself of uh, capacitated investing citizens. So it's to do with an awareness campaign which as financial institutions will also assist. But the, land, the industry itself must go out there and sell itself because you're competing uh, for investments with other sectors, the stock market and elsewhere. So you need to, to, to champion your cause as well. I think lastly, uh, when you look at most of what's, what's happening now, the first move advantage is going to be key. Uh, and we see opportunities for especially local banks that have strong parent outside where they can possibly come, come up with some kind of facilities that can even assist in, in, in trying to lend to specific projects. So we think with the risk you know, for Zimbabwe you know, coming down, opportunities where the local banks can partner the strong parent from outside and come up with the you know, necessary facilities that can assist in that regard. Well, thanks for those reassuring words from our panelists. We'll take two questions from the floor, uh, two burning questions. I want to believe that this is one of the sticking points for moving the industry forward. So I would expect that there will be questions or comments. I think the audience is hungry. And uh, the science speak for themselves. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think our work is done as a panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause. We shall now break for lunch, and as I said, we will allocate 40 minutes. We've already taken three of those 40, so we'll regroup at 10 past 2, uh, and with or without you, we will proceed. Please go ahead and With whose impact is lasting? Um, so with me, I have uh, Paul Jordan, and I'm sure the discussions prior are like a beautiful drone snake. And uh, I know Jordan very well. You will not add legs if you are to look east for uh, to understand what we are going, what is going to take place right now. So let me give you the opportunity, Paul Jordan. You've got uh, ten minutes. because what, we, what I'm going to talk about is how do we make a finite industry that's not sustainable, what we mine will end up a mangura, will end up a hole in the ground. How do we make that intergenerational? So how do we make mining, which is unsustainable because it exploits a finite resource, indirectly sustainable through investment in other forms of capital? And the particular LHD and an articulated dump truck, it's likely you can make a truck, right? So you find many companies starting mining and then moving to the commercial sector. The third is your forward linkages, and they're the critical 
elements of downstream beneficiation, but particularly for your local economy. Those intermediate products that you need for your development, not lithium. Lithium ultimately will go into batteries somewhere else. So what's important is steel, which you have to have for construction, for manufacturing. The next is polymers. Most, the second biggest. What we're looking at then is the downstream, then into what are your key strategic minerals. And they're not the sexy ones. They're not the lithiums or the tantalums and that. They are cement, steel, polymers, copper, aluminium, that go in and are finally consumed in your economy. So, sustainable development, those were the most important minerals. That doesn't mean to say you shouldn't push hard to add value to other minerals before export, because that has a positive effect on the balance of payments, that employs more people in technology development. And those two are also critical for the backward linkages. Um, in 1913, we finished the draft minerals development policy for um, Zimbabwe that is substantially aligned to the AMV, and then it kind of got lost, I don't know, maybe in the internet cloud, I don't know where it got lost. It went extensive stakeholder consultations with public meetings across the country in Arari, Gweru, Borowayo, Bashvingo, Matari, and others. Um, what we need to do, what I would recommend is done is that draft development policy or vision needs finalization because it needs to be the basis for amendments to the Act. So first the green paper or white paper, then amendments to the Act. Are we live now? I don't want to look at myself, I'm not going to Um, the other linkage that really we can't do much about are the consumption linkages. Of course, the mining and processing industry, they're paying wages. Those wages are spent in tuck shops, they're spent in bars, they're spent in all kinds of places, so you get your induced or consumption linkages. Um, obviously, the mining industry can't really do much about that. Only the national um, tariff regime can change what, to what extent that basket of goods are made in Zimbabwe or made elsewhere. There we go. We have. So, there, in a single crowded slide, I've tried to put the AMV, you can see the value addition in the center, into your key minerals for local development. Your infrastructure linkages, your fiscal, which feed around, of course, fiscal linkages into geo knowledge. We heard several times we don't invest in not what the companies do, they cherry pick exploration, systematic geo survey, geochemistry, geophysics. That's what throws up new anomalies and new discoveries, right? So we have to, we don't take a bit of the fiscus now, despite fiscal, a limited fiscal space to reinvest in the mines of 20 years time. <coughs> Systematic geosurvey now will only give you a mine in 15, 20 years time. Then, gone again. Uh, you got me again, I'm sorry. <laughs> I so a key, how can one we, minute to clear one minute. What are the key instruments? The key instruments that governments all over the world have used is on the backward linkages to do the normal, normal soft link, the soft incentives like tax breaks, um, etc. But also to have local content minimum targets as part of the mining license. The same with downstream. One method that's been used by other countries is it an independent analysis of the viability of the next step if that is viable real rate of return of great greater than 10 percent then the company will be obligated to go there i.e you're only obligated if there's first a, a pre-feasibility study on it 
The other is um, a percentage of payroll in South Africa, 5% of payroll by any mining company must be spent on human resource development. It's also been promoted now that also half a percent of sales on technology development in the country. Just to ensure that this is done. Half a percent is the global average for mining and all you're really saying is don't do it in France or in Australia that half a percent spend here at our local universities, etc. Is this thing working? We can move on from this. I've only got a minute left, so it's hardly worth using this. Um, finally, if we look at the economies of scale for our key feedstocks like polymer, steel, etc., it becomes clear not only the key feedstocks, also the mining inputs. We need to realize the regional market. The regional market, market for mining capital goods is bigger than Europe. We have a bigger market than Europe, yet we dominate, not dominated by imports from Europe. In most items, if we try and compete, we only have 1% of the vehicle market of Europe, but we have a bigger market than Europe for mining capital goods and inputs. Therefore, if we have the regional market, most of your mining inputs could be produced in the static. We have the economies of scale. The same goes for downstream. Unfortunately, when you're a late starter like we are, the economies of scale have shot up. Only 30 years ago, you could have steel plants of only 200,000 tons per annum. Today, you won't get a wave of less than 2 million. So, sorry, more you exceeded your overdraft facility. My overdraft facility. Okay, so my final point is we need to move to a regional mining vision, a regional mining strategy where we pull together but at the same time recognize that some countries like Zimbabwe and South Africa have an advantage and therefore recognition is discounted for the more powerful economies to combat, combat the old Bombazonki phenomenon. You remember from the Central African Federation where Harari became the Bambazonki and that caused the breakup. So we need to deal with variable geometry, i.e. that some countries are way behind others, so we need to level the playing field. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, Mr. Javanki, I'm sure you um, seen the news, mega deals are being announced, billions, billions. How linked is our mining sector and how are we primed to do an sustainable development impact from these mining deals that we are experiencing? So I think you need to help us on that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all, all, all um, from a CZI perspective, our interest in getting involved has been to, try to do with uh, developing uh, the economy. As you are aware, uh, there are various ways economies can be, can be developed. You have your export-oriented strategies, you have your resource-oriented uh, strategies. So in this case, it's the resource-oriented strategy. Because we do have companies that are out there in Lawai, Harare, Marondi, where that um, used to operate and they will serve the mining sector. So it is important that we try and rebuild these leakages because in other countries, they try to build these companies. So under the GSP, uh, which is to try and create a framework for um, for actually now putting this in place, where we, we, we build the linkages. We came up with three committees, uh, engineering and steel, chemicals, and uh, PPE, and the sectors of those particular uh, industrial associations that said that said those we met the the, 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 the chairperson. And uh, under GSP, most of our time was they spent on the local content, which we uh, referred to just now. Um, and uh, <coughs> unfortunately, it has not worked as well as we, we, we wanted to. Because the, I think some of the way they went through the, the first one was well, the purpose was to visit clients, find out what they need, to start to build the strategies for linkages. Some of them, when they went to the first clients, started getting, getting the benefit, the ball was lost, and you know, some way now starting to benefit from this. But what, what is important is we, 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 we also try to understand why we need to do these linkages. As I said, 
we need a better economy. Economy can only be built um, if you, you realize that you have to take some concrete steps and some policy measures that will help. We've read SICs before, we've read the Veritas, and what we're seeing in the industry is that over the, in the last three years, that has been positive. So the last four where we need to create linkages is actually um, uh, uh, mining. And why do we need to do that? You know, sometimes we also need to say there's, there's something that exists beyond ourselves industry, that is mining and, uh, and, 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 and the manufacturing sector and the service sectors. There is the issue about when you look at the human development goals of Zimbabwe, you realize that our mortality rate is not is, is, is really deplorable. The, that is infant mortality rate and, and you know, malnutrition. And why is this? It's because the parents of those children do not have incomes. And this is how we can, for us to create incomes, we have to create these linkages to create more, more, more jobs. You know, the, the number of women dying in, uh, in, 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 in uh, giving birth, again, it's because they, can, they don't have incomes to go and fetch uh, the right uh, type of medical assistance. So we, 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 we are really passionate about this. We will continue pushing the linkages uh, uh, together with the GSP as well as the local content. <coughs> Thank you very much. I am Minister of Industry here. And our best uh, is our policy to a framework find to make sure that uh, your industry becomes relevant. Otherwise, if it's not linked, it is, we would say there's no Minister of Industry. I understand next uh, the President pro promised that he would uh, want to trim the cabinet. So for you to be relevant, what are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I can start by just uh, sharing with the participants in this conference what the ministry is doing, currently doing in order to resuscitate or to increase the capacity of the industrial sector to respond to the needs of the of all other sectors, the mining sector in the From a policy perspective, we are currently reviewing the industrial development policy. Um, the one which we had has already expired, and we are now looking at coming up with a new policy. And this one, this time around, find the policy that we are working on uh, is more is broader than the one the, the one which has expired. It's going to be a five-year policy, so it's going to be having yeah, very strong linkages with all other sectors, the mining sector included. From the ministry's perspective, also we find. Uh, the ministry is working on various subsectoral policies. One of them being the iron and steel strategy, which has already been developed. We have developed in the motor industry development strategy, pharmaceuticals, cotton, leather, and we are looking at coming up with various other subsectoral strategies. In other words, we are saying we need to look at various subsectors. Then we create, at least we then work on creating the necessary linkages with the other sectors on a value chain approach. So in other words, the ministry is coming up with a raft of measures and also working with the private sector to come up with a local content policy. That, just like Mr. Jawande has already, already alluded to, this one we are now looking at validating work that has already been done and we are looking at all stakeholders making their input into that policy document. In other words, what we have noticed also is the mining sector in itself, about 89% of its consumables and some of the raw materials, they are being imported, almost 89%. But some of the, those things can actually be supplied by the local manufacturing sector. So as the ministry are saying, let us create strong linkages between the mining sector and all other sectors of the economy. I will give examples. If you are looking at um, your protective clothing, including your, your, your footwear, the surface shoes that you need, your furniture, all other, some of these smaller consumables, the business cards, most of these are being imported. But the local industry now has capacity to, to produce these. And the funny thing is, find some of the things that 
are being imported, particularly from our neighboring countries, would have been exported by our local manufacturers. Then we have our companies here in Zimbabwe, going maybe to South Africa, some of these uh, shops in South Africa, and we purchase the products, only to find out that they are being manufactured here locally. So before you do maybe your plan your purchasing, you need maybe to look around, particularly for such things as furniture, for your offices, for protective clothing, like I already alluded to. So in other words, we are saying, let's come together as stakeholders and see where we can possibly work together so that at least our manufacturing sector is able to supply some of the needs. Because we are looking at, just like it's already been alluded to, this is the multi-billion dollar industry that we are looking at, the mining industry. So if we could have a higher proportion of it, or for that income circulating within Zimbabwe, within our own people, then that will have ripple effects, or that will actually aid us, the aid in the development of our own manufacturing industry, leading to more people being employed, building our export capacity, and also reducing our import bill. Thank you. Okay. Um. I can take three uh, questions from three different people, so one per person. Any takers? Okay, uh, I'll take the gentleman who is close by. I think I want to talk about Cisco Steel in terms of the role it plays the rail network, we see the mining sector. There's so much happening and uh, uh, still our rail is not in place with the trains which are here. I've not seen them moving at all. Yet they think rail is not important. So what was first, to fix the rail or to bring the trains before the rail? <laughs> I don't understand. So to me, uh, I want to understand this is still we are now in Parliament, we are moving that the debt must be uh, taken over. But what then happens? Is there going to be another Zisco steel? Because you are looking at a billion dollars needed to resuscitate Zisco steel. And you can actually move 100 meters away and start another new Zisco steel for less than a billion. So what's the point of resuscitating? If you look at the world market price of steel as well. Sorry, um, the time factor. Can I just finish? All right. The, you need, the local industry needs 250 tons, which Blast Furnace 3 can do, if I'm not mistaken. Blast Furnace 4 does 750,000 tons. So, what's the point of then doing Blast Furnace 4 for 750 tons for export, when really the thing market has already been flooded? Can I take two more? Thank you very much. Uh, my question is directed to the uh, Minister of Industry. Uh, we have intimated that um, equipment is actually being brought from outside. I remember last year uh, at the uh, direct year, there was launch of 50 million towards a uh, boosting, uh, specifically to boost local suppliers that manufacture the same uh, equipment. Up to now, nothing has materialized. What I what is what I say about that? Okay, uh, two out of three. That's not so bad. Yeah. So I will give the panel the chance to respond uh, while it's also wrapping up, starting with the Minister of Industry. <laughs> It was more of a, 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 a comment than a, a, a person, but this was still remains a priority as far as government is concerned. It's a resuscitation 
if it's everyone is quite aware that this research station will have ripple effects in the, in the, the industry as a whole, the, mine, mine, the mining sector included. So it remains top priority in terms of resuscitation. And there are currently initiatives that are going on related to the resuscitation of this for steel. On the second person, maybe if you can come again, I didn't quite get you clearly on that one. Sorry, maybe before you go to the second question, my question was, what is the point of resuscitating Cisco Steel Blast Furnace 4, which does 750 tons for export, yet the, the thing price of steel has gone down, and it is the people who buy who dictate the price. If you are going to, to resuscitate, you have to do Blast Furnace 3, which is for the local consumption. So are you going to do Blast Furnace 4? That's my question. And how much will it cost? And is it not better to start a new Cisco steel? I, I think on that one, then that issue can be maybe discussed at a, at a higher level in terms of what, can, what needs to be done at policy level. Otherwise, I don't think I'm in a position to really say, let's do this, let's do, we can do this. I think it's like you've already alluded to say, these are issues that have already even been discussed in Parliament. I think recommendations are most welcome, and engagements with the Ministry can continue so that at least we realize maximum value as a nation. Thank you. Just on the point of order, she, she is this permanent secretary who is the chief accounting officer, and you are in charge for policy implementation. We are not playing games here. And you are telling me you don't know. This is a debt in Parliament. I'm not talking about the debt. I'm talking about policy implementation, which you are responsible for. And you're telling us you don't know. I mean, where are we going? Is this the thing? Let's get serious with business. You're the chief accounting officer. Uh, thanks, Honorable Melissa. I think sometimes the it is OK. Um, but uh, she has also said, uh, for now, Let's start with the discussion and then we entertain it at a higher level. And I'm sure it's not the first question that has been skipped around. Uh, for my, my, I asked three questions, I never had any response. So, <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. I would want you to wrap up so that we also. Okay. But maybe a point of correction that uh, I've been referred to as the human sector. I will represent in the human sector. And there are issues which I note and then I take to my, to my human sector. Like in this case, the combination which we have made, I think that will, I will really take it up with my human sector. I thank you. Uh, Paul Jaja, one minute. Your last word. Um, I think the issue of economy scale were raised regarding um, Zisco Steel, but they apply across the board. We really need to start thinking regionally. And whilst doing that, also take into consideration that the playing field is not level. So how do we integrate regionally our mining inputs and output markets, our linkages? <coughs> At the same time, having special measures for countries that aren't already in the starting blocks, that are still in the, uh, in the training area. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to put emphasis that uh, earlier on in the presentations, there was the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the presentation on the target to be middle income economy by 2030 with a growth rate of 18%. We, as, 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 as the manufacturing sector, have also been unpacking this and it was throwing out uh, a growth rate of about 18% that's required. And also, what is required in this economy for us to achieve that target is to increase the economic complexity of this economy. So by creating these linkages, we can achieve that target. But the danger that we have is that we are also a resource-rich country, which means we could suffer what is called the Dutch disease. But but for us not to do that, we must now create these linkages as deliberate actions. Uh, 
Thank, thank you very much. I think to EPA, uh, Section 315, Subsection 2C of our Constitution requires contract <coughs> transparency during negotiation and performance monitoring by Parliament. And regrettably, we have yet several mining deals being announced, and the prior public is blindfolded to see how well are the deals primed to achieve the linkages that we are discussing now. So I think it would be very good for industry also to follow best practice and disclose um, the terms and conditions of um, mining deals because the minerals are a finite public asset. So that's where the public interest comes from. So thank you. Panel, thank you very much. And uh, I think on behalf of, of the hotel, let me apologize for the glitches that you set your presentation. But I think you tackled the subject of uh, linkages very well. Uh, so again, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank We started off with uh, an opening address from the, the President of the Chamber, Mr. Manando, uh, and in summary he talked about the growing confidence in the mining industry arising from the political uh, developments that have taken place in the last six months. Uh, he also looked at uh, the prospects being bright. Uh, uh, if you look at the first quarter production, and he specifically mentioned gold, uh, you can see that there are significant increases in the volumes of, of minerals produced compared to uh, the similar period of last year. Uh, the expectation of uh, the Chamber is that uh, capital inflows are expected to increase uh, on the back of uh, reforms being undertaken by government, uh, which are expected to increase confidence uh, and take away uncertainty from the market. Uh, however, there is an acknowledgement that there remains an outstanding legislative agenda uh, and policy support which is required uh, for the growth of uh, the mines and mineral sector. Our guest of honor, the Minister of Mines, Honorable Chitando, then uh, gave us a keynote address where he reiterated government's commitment to promoting investment uh, which has been demonstrated and prioritized. We also highlighted uh, the protection of investment, uh, which I think has come out very clearly from pronouncements from government. Uh, the minister lamented uh, environmental degradation uh, by some mining operations, and I think he specifically touched on uh, the, the road uh, past water river between Shurubi and uh, Shara. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, in future, the ministry would like to strictly enforce uh, the provisions of the law in terms of uh, environmental protection. The Ministry also wants to ensure that the provisions in the Mines and Minerals Act will be adhered to, especially in terms of how mining title is protected. And I think you gave notice that with effect from January 2019, uh, the Ministry will be very uh, strict on this one. We then had a ministerial panel uh, which uh, talked about the need for policy consistency uh, and I think we all recognize that this is a major requirement to give confidence, especially to the investor public. Uh, the panel also talked about the need for the rule of law, again another important uh, element in inspiring confidence. They also talked about the need for a review of the indigenization law, uh, which has been left being applicable to platinum and diamond. And I think uh, Honorable Uliswa uh, specifically questioned whether this is in terms of the law or this is just an arbitrary announcement. Um, the panel also talked of the need to avail long term capital for mining, which I think we all recognize mining being a capital intensive industry. Um, the, the panel also talked about the need for the Reserve Bank uh, to be sensitive to the needs, the foreign currency needs of the large gold producers, uh, 
as they are currently compromised when it comes to the retention of their foreign currency earnings. There are a number of medium to long term uh, power projects uh, that were shared with us uh, that we look forward to that will improve uh, availability of power. Uh, and I think uh, the, the Minister's projection was that in seven years' time, Zimbabwe will become a net exporter of power. Uh, by the end of June 2018, uh, certain announcements are expected to be made in terms of fuel projects, uh, and the Minister also talked about the potential for uh, Zimbabwe to produce an increased gold. Uh, he, he cited a figure of 85 uh, tons per year, but he said, you know, if we make good progress, this will go up to 100 tons a year. Uh, the panel also certainly underscored the need to conserve and use energy efficiently, as well as to encourage uh, private players to generate power and uh, push it into the national grid. And then we had uh, Dr. Maponga of uh, uh, the United Nations talking about the need for an African mining vision, which uh, links mining policy consistencies and the mining, African mining vision. Uh, he talked about the need to develop strong linkages, which we've just been uh, uh, hearing from our last panel, between mining and the, the rest of the economy. Uh, he also mentioned the need to promote local content and I think it also talks to linkages when, when we look at it. Uh, Dr. Mapongo, Maponga then also said we need to improve competitiveness uh, in the country. is still ranked very lowly uh, when you look at the indices uh, of the Fraser Institute. So I think, uh, and I think he did underscore the fact that whether we, we consider those indices fair or unfair, uh, the fact remains that uh, the investor public uses those to, to make decisions. And so, we need to be guided uh, by the indices uh, to try and improve our position and our standing globally. We then had a uh, panel on financing solutions, uh, which talked about lending to the mining sector, uh, declining uh, largely to do with uh, the shortage of foreign currency in the country, as well as to do with the country risk, uh, which has uh, sort of slowed down the inflows uh, of foreign capital. Um, the panel also then looked at the need for matching projects to specific financial instruments, um, and then talked about the fact that banks should provide medium to long-term capital to the mining sector. The, the last panel, which was the panel on linkages, then talked about maximizing contributions uh, uh, of the mining industry through linkages with the rest of the economy, which had been touched on earlier. They also identified the various linkages, the backward, the forward, the side stream, downstream uh, linkages, and other forms of linkages. And clearly, uh, the, those linkages will help uh, to catalyze the uh, growth of the national economy. I think as we go away, there are a number of fundamental questions that we need to ask ourselves and perhaps have more discussions as a nation and as an industry about them. Specifically, there was the talk about Zisco Steel. So the question is, do we resuscitate Zisco Steel and restart a new plant? Do we benefit to the extent of producing the finished product or do we ship out you know, a semi-finished product and let the rest of the world do it. And again, because we are playing in a global environment, look at what Rio Tinto is doing in Australia. They're shipping iron ore to China. So who are we? The next question, exploration. Who takes responsibility for the risk of putting money where the success rate is anything between 5 and 10 percent? Is it government? Or is it the private sector? The fact that the Rhodesians had an exploration company in 1968 does not mean we should go. Let's look at the other circumstances. In 1968, Rhodesia was isolated and increasingly so. And maybe that is what forced them to do. So let's think about it seriously. The next question is capacitation. 
As you see more investor interest coming into this country, you find that our, especially the offices of the Ministry of Mines need to provide great information that will quickly inform, uh, especially those investors who have little knowledge about this country, about the best information that is the way to find uh, the next deposits for where to invest their money. If you go to the Geological Survey Library to look for information, you'll find that there's a point at which information just stops uh, being updated. And it's not because the people who work in that library are not interested, it's not because the department is not interested, but it's a capacity issue. So do we fund exploration, or do we fund departments that are already in existence? The next question. We have country image perception issues that we need to manage. Is it government's business alone, or is it everybody's business? Sometimes when you listen, you find people are always whinging and complaining, Oh, the government is not doing enough. But what do we say about our own country when we are out there? Food for thought. And lastly, on linkages, what are our priorities? Do we have a roadmap? We can't just want all these linkages to happen all at once. So again, we need to strategize, we need to prioritize, we need to come up with a roadmap. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try to summarize and now we are coming to the end. I will now invite the Vice President of the Chamber, the Senior Vice President, Mrs. Elizabeth Newman, this one to give us the Thank you to our speakers and our panelists who are very well researched. Well done. My personal experience is that what, we defi what defines the success of any conference is the work behind the scenes. I would like to thank the guidance of our presidium, executive members of the chamber and the secretariat. There's a lot of work that took place behind the scenes. But what we've also realized in the past is that um, these conferences keep getting better each year. We get our strategic direction from the contributions that come from here, and then throughout the year we'll be working on them. So it makes it easier for the next conference. Thank you to everyone who contributed. And um, when we speak of minors, most of the time we forget the community. I'm glad um, we recognize Chief Mapanjura. Is from our constituents. So thank you for coming, Chief. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank uh, all the delegates and the sponsors. Thank you very much for making this happen. Lastly, I want to thank our Honorable Minister Shchan for the guidance and the commitment and the energy that he has, the support from the government um, generally. And then thank you to our MC, a very well, a job well done. Can I ask um, Mrs. Bonjola to come and do a, a closing prayer for us? Thank you.
Thank you, Lord. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I think with that closing prayer, we've come to the end of our conference. Ladies and gentlemen, you all stand down. Thank you.